Welcome to Foundation Repair Success Secrets, the podcast that's rocking the foundation repair industry. Discover how to boost your leads, raise your profits, and lift your digital presence. Together, let's dig deep and transform your foundation repair business. Welcome to another awesome episode of Foundation Repair Success Secrets. We have probably the coolest background guest we've ever had on the show. <laughs> we have Bill from Dry Zone today. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was a fun intro. Usually the intros are a little stale, but I, I don't know what else to say other than you have the coolest background we've had so there far. So. <laughs> the full view. You well, actually cool. have to see the other side of it. It's even better. So. Oh, man. All right. Yeah. Well, that's a tease for episode two one day in the future. <laughs> um, well, Bill, yeah. How did, how did you get into the business? You know, how did you get where you are? Yeah, so um, about 20 years ago, uh, we started out as a waterproofer, and we're part of a network called Basement Systems. And, you know, we just did crawl spaces and basement waterproofing. And one of our dealers in Omaha, they were called Thrasher Basement Systems. Uh, they ended up starting a network with our current waterproofing network, and it was called Foundation Support Works. And, you know, they we just started peering and, and all that good stuff. So it was it was kind of very symbiotic i guess in a way because like you know when you're in crawl spaces the joists will start to sag and peer sink and you know you're you're seeing the foundation things that are wrong with it and we could dry it up but we couldn't put it back together so you know when they started support works uh it was a uh it was just a natural fit so it was, it was scary because i you know i'd never done hydraulics and i didn't understand about you know anything like that but they had a, a lot of great trainings and we have a lot of good people who work for us and stuff like that but you know we've been doing that for almost 20 years now so man so not an overnight success no definitely not an overnight success we we, <laughs> we learned a lot of stuff the hard way so right isn't that funny too because i assume you're you know pretty surrounded with successful people you would say what two percent is overnight success i mean every once in a while someone gets lucky with the lottery or crypto or something yeah, well, I think a lot of people just scale differently, you know, like we um, we're in Delaware, so there's not exactly a huge amount of people. So, I mean, you know, like if you're in Denver or Atlanta, you know, you have a tremendous amount of people very close. Uh, and then a lot of folks where we live, they just, you know, they were like they were just older folks with farms and stuff like that. And they were just like, well, the crack's been there for 10 years. What's so mm. bad about it? Well, they never noticed that the crack got a lot bigger over those years. Um, so, you know, we had to really educate our homeowners and almost build the industry because like, no, like nobody was doing foundation repair here. So, uh, I mean, hell, nobody was doing waterproofing either. So, you know, it was like water in your crawl space. Why is that bad? You know, so, <laughs> you know, we had to do a lot of education and, you know, we kind of invented the industry and then had to redefine the industry. So. That's fascinating. I just got off the phone with someone and that was kind of what we were talking about is like, you know, the education versus grabbing demand. And I was like, hey, in, in his particular world, I said, let's grab the demand that's available. We kind of did some behind the scenes work and, and proved to him, showed him, hey, there is demand on one percentage or, or let's say one half of your business model. You're interested in the other half. Let's go pay the bills with the half that there's current demand. Right. let's then use the profits where we can to do the education cycle because it, it it's not an overnight thing how long did it take you guys to get through that educational cycle come out the other side so you know i you know i don't know if you ever come out the other side by the way but you know <laughs> we, um it was weird you know when when i started our business i started it with my wife my mother-in-law and father-in-law and we each had separate businesses so heather and i we had some verizon wireless stores and i was doing like crawl spaces on the side uh, Gary and Lydia, they had a, uh, they were manufacturing filtration products for Wells. And uh, I was shipping all of my stuff to Gary's shop. And, you know, one day he just kind of said, Hey, Heather, I think I kind of want to do this with Bill. And she was like, well, you need to have a chat with him. And, um, you know, I, I worked with my parents my whole life, most of it, you know, so they were in construction. And, um, so I was like, Hey, that's cool. You know, I got to spend that first half of my life with my mom and dad doing that stuff. Now I get to spend the second half of my life with my father and mother-in-law, you know? So, um, we, uh, I'll be honest with you, we kind of started it as a goof. I, we were doing very well with our stores, with our cell phone stores. And, um, you know, it was neat hanging out at Gary's shop and everything. And, um, we didn't really take it super seriously for the first couple of years. I mean, we did, but we didn't, you know, um, but, uh, it wasn't where we were getting our money from, you know, it's not how I paid my bills. So, uh, 
when we decided they were going to shut their business down and we were going to sell off the stores, uh, it was um, that was a little scary because then all of a sudden it's like, all right, now we got to make this, you know, we got to be serious about this. Um, but it was neat, you know, like we we've been very lucky because we we got to be around these networks of of waterproofers and foundation repair companies, and you know they 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 you get to you get to learn a lot better than you would if you were doing it on your own because I got to learn from hundreds of other dealers' mistakes. And then I actually mm. have to learn from their successes, you know. So, you know, and there's tons of training. And I hated school when I was in school. You know, I hated <laughs> high school. I went to college for like two minutes and I was like, yeah, I'm just not gonna be the college guy. But now I love training and, and going to these schools that we get to go to and because it makes you a lot smarter, you know. So yeah, I don't think funny. that really answers your question, but no, no, we'll get to it. I'll I'll kind of peel the onion one layer at a time. <laughs> I, I do think what you just touched on is important because in the industry, a lot of people, I mean, myself, I didn't love school. I thought it was really a waste of time, waste of money. But what was funny is almost like reading a book in school. I hated the books they made us read, but I love the books that I chose myself. Exactly, yeah. Oh, I could burn through a book that I actually cared about relative to the one that the teacher said, all right, you got to read this old book from the 1800s about a farm and like, you know, crazy stuff. So I would say, you know, find something that you're interested in and drill that thing, go deep, mm -hmm. going wide in a number of things like you guys even referenced in your business ventures. It wasn't like, hey, let's go do everything and attempt to go do them deeply. Let's kind of go do one thing really well. Maybe we test the waters a little bit here. Let's take care of that thing either through a disposition or, or you know, delegation. And then we're going to go deep dive this next thing. So you guys have been doing this for 20 years now. You have a lot of great reviews. What are some of your scaling secrets? Um, of course, having a good networking group and, and schooling education is huge. Yeah, the, the biggest thing that I think really kind of started um, making us who we are was when Heather and I, because Heather and I, we've been the managing partner for like 15, 16 years now. Um, we don't really mm -hmm. don't see Gary and Lydia very much, like at work anyway, um, was we kind of, we sat down and we wanted to figure out what, what we wanted. So um, Gary, he had started another business with his son. So we had moved out of our original building and it was kind of me and Heather on our own. So we kind of sat down and said, you know, well, what are we going to do? What do we want this to look like? How are we going to do it? And our whole thing was we wanted to build a business that we wanted to work in, uh, which meant we had to come up with our vision, our mission, and our values. And so, you know, we sat down really, really hard and we sat down with some of our leadership team. And, you know, like our vision is a world where the extraordinary is the expectation. And, mm. you know, I'm a consumer too, and it's it's funny, like, I was talking with uh, some of my friends the other day and, you know, we, because I, I, we live, eat and breathe our vision, mission and values. Like, you know, they, they say that the definition of integrity is doing the right thing, even when no one's looking. Uh, and, you know, when, when you're in business, we, we don't set goals for our company. Like we don't sit down at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year and say, okay, what is, what's our overall number going to be next year? What are these KPIs, that KPI? You know, we talk about, how many homeowners we're going to be able to help. Mm. Um, like we hate the word customer, you know, because we don't have customers. You go to McDonald's, that's a customer. You know, we, <laughs> we're working in someone's home. You know, that's that's literally where sometimes where someone's born, where you raise a family, and sometimes where you die. So we 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 train and teach and talk to all of our employees about how important it is that we're working in someone's home. So we believe that we're ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. Mm, it's like a Chick Fil A model, <laughs> like you said. Yeah, you know, you get really, McDonald's, really Chick Fil A, high level. It, it really is, you know. And it's it, but when you when you start assigning a dollar figure to a homeowner or a customer, um, that's all they become is a dollar a dollar sign, right? Mm. You know, instead of you know, like we talk about our sales folks, our designers, they have to give every um, foreman. Um, this thing called a notes to form. It's just a page about, hey, these are the things that are important to the homeowner, you know, their why, you know, like we live concrete. So, you know, it's it's not that you have some sidewalks that are uneven. It's you don't want your grandmother or your grandfather slipping and falling on your concrete when they're coming to your house for Thanksgiving. That's right. the important thing for the homeowner, not that the concrete's, you know, uneven or whatever. So, so we really talk about the why behind 
you know, what the project actually is. And what that does is it makes our foremans and our co-foremans and our text on the crews really understand why it's so important because they're not just lifting a piece of concrete at that point. They're saving someone's grandmother or their grandfather mm. or whoever, you know? That's cool. Yeah, it's funny. It makes me think of some of the sales training videos I've seen where they're like, hey, you know, do you have a family? You know, what's your what's your kids' names? Blah, blah. And then they, they're like, huh, taking notes on that. And then later mm -hmm. they'll come back to it and they'll be like, all right, so, you know, your, your home's starting to sag. Do you want your kids to, to be in a home where it's not safe or it, it looks, you know, like you can go on and on and on, but they're really focused on the critical mass, not the aesthetic surrounding it. And a lot of people, I feel like that's where they fall. They fall into the numbers. They fall into who's the cheapest, you know, all this crazy stuff. When really the, the core nucleus is where you need to be honed in on. How long did it take you guys to figure that out? Was that from day one in the business or was that something that's evolved over time and trained in? I think like, like I said, we both have and we both grew up in entrepreneurial homes, you know? And I think that we've always cared, we've always called them our homeowners. Like, you know, we will meet other friends that have businesses and they just call them customers. And it's always just really irritated us, right? So I think mm. it's always something that, that we believed in. Um, you know, it's, it's, it all sounds cliche. Like, you know, it's when someone is, is, is having a transaction with someone, if it's just about the money, then it's just about the money. And it really doesn't mean anything, you know? So Heather and I, we, we truly believe that, you know, we want, we just don't want a simple transaction, you know, that we truly affect change in someone's life by fixing their home. You know, because like I said, we're consumers too. And I've had good um, experiences, but I've had bad experiences. And, you know, in life, everybody has all these good and bad experiences. And if you can sit there and say, you know, if if I truly believe that I want to, to, to help someone and affect a change in someone's life, then it can't be about the dollar. The dollar mm. will come. I mean, don't get me wrong. Listen, Heather and I, we have a very good life. Um, but it's not even just about us. Like when we first started our business, we didn't, um, we didn't, we didn't bring a brand new car in, right? We didn't have a brand new car. We always bought used because we said, well, if we get a brand new car, our formers are going to get upset saying, oh, they're just making all the money and everything. Well, then we right. kind of said, okay, well, that's not a good idea because, you know, then we're not really showing anybody what's possible. Right. So we get a new car, then one of our foremans gets a new car and you celebrate that. Right. Uh, it's like homes, you know, like, like the coolest thing that I saw in our business was when people started buying homes. Yeah. Because they worked for us. And that's, that's like, if that doesn't get y'all warm and fuzzy inside, nothing will, you know, because, because we started this thing, you know, 20 years ago um, with just the four of us and we worked in it, you know, for ourselves for a long time. Like I was the original installer, the original sales guy, Gary was out there oh, helping really? all and, so yeah, I mean, I've destroyed my knees. I can't even get on my knees hardly anymore because of it. You know? Oh man. Um, well, cross faces are bad, and I didn't like knee pads. I was young and stupid. So right, um, and there are some some spaces are legitimate army crawl spaces. Some are kneel down. Some are you know you just some are like back. swimming. Like we go we go as oh. low as sixteen inches. You know so. Wow. Oh my gosh. Man, I've been in some bad crawl spaces because I'm I like going out with my clients. I like kind of being in the world. Um, I've been in the trenches too. Some of those trenches are pretty crazy before they put some piers in. That's crazy. So your knees, it's constant. That's where all, all the profit from the business just go to Bill's knees. <laughs> just well, it. That's the whole mission now. It's, you know, it's like, I, I should honestly, I should probably go get them operated on, but they're not as bad as something like that. And then it's also, it's not really the knee, it's the bone below the knees. Cause I was always like, because I was always just, you know, beating them up and everything. And then we did basement waterproof. And so they were always on concrete. And, you know, we mm. we talk a lot about safety in our company because, you know, these young guys, they'll do the exact same thing I was doing. They're jumping off of box trucks. And, you know, I'm like, guys, you can't, you're going to bust your knees up doing that. And it's like, it's it doesn't hurt when you're in your 20s. Right. Like, I just turned 50 last year. And, you know, my funny joke is, you know, well, if I'd have known I would have lived this long, I would have taken better care of myself. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you know, it's... It's uh, like when um, I play a lot of golf, so getting down in that hole to grab my ball, it's it's a lot harder than it would have been, you know, 20 years ago. So, you know, take take care of your knees. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, how about um, you touched on the success of your team members, right? I, I kind of envision it 
where if you're successful, they're successful. Like that's a real business. Those are quality people. Um, I've worked very close with the sales teams, with the management, et cetera. I once was in one of their meetings and I heard the man, the ownership rather beyond the managers, the owners say, we've developed our contracts where if you guys mess up on an estimate, you're paying for it, not us. I was like, oh my God, this is not a client I can work with anymore. They're crazy. Um, what are what are the, some of those? Because I could tell it's in you and clearly it, it must be in your spouse with your wife. What are some of those important, true, caring business ownership traits, characteristic practices that you guys instill? Like you mentioned, you want your team to succeed with cars and houses and things like that. Um, I assume you guys probably do some really awesome team building, some great parties, perhaps. What are some of those things that build this culture? Yeah. So, well, the first thing is, is it's not if I'm successful, they're successful. If, if they're successful, I'm successful. You're successful. Right, right. So so some of the neat things that we do that a lot of companies do. Well, first of all, we have an ice cream machine in our office, you know, like and I can tell you the reason why McDonald's, their ice cream machines are always broken. It's not because they're broken. It's because they're a pain in the ass with like clean. You know, I've heard that the clean aspect. They, yeah. they really are. They are a pain to clean. Um, and we have popcorn machines and you know stuff like that. But like we don't do Christmas parties anymore. You know, the last okay. real Christmas party we had was I think it was our tenth year anniversary, and we had this huge masquerade ball, right? And it was at a country club, and everybody was in tuxedos, and you know half of the uh, thing was a dance floor. There was bands and everything, and halftime we opened up the. Uh, the curtains and there was a whole casino in there and it was, it was a lot of fun it was a ton of fun right well they were like thirty thousand dollars so mm -hmm. i told heather i was like and we were sitting there talking and it was like man we could have we could have taken everybody on a cruise for that amount um so sure. the next year that's kind of what we did we so we we formed a christmas party now they're christmas vacations um cool. but we we call it disappear so you know our first christmas vacation was on a cruise to the uh Bermuda. And, um, you know, we took the employees and we said, if you want to take, you know, your spouse or your partner or whatever it is you have, it was like an extra 500 bucks or something. And we okay. did, there was like half the company went and we all went to Bermuda. It was a lot of fun. And, you know, we've done Disney and we've done great. Um, we did, uh, um, Bush gardens, um, not last year, but the year before we had rented out a suite at the, the Washington commander stadium. Uh, not cause I like the commanders, but they were the, closest team uh right <laughs> so uh, i i'm a bronco fan so i hate the redskins but i can like <laughs> um but you know there's a lot of folks who can't go because they it's always like the first weekend in december or whatever so a lot of folks they have things planned with their family and there's a lot of stuff going on it's right after thanksgiving right before christmas and all that so when we had rented out the uh the suite for the season this allowed people that maybe never had a chance to go to be able to go because it's you know it's september it's august it's september it's october it's november you know january whatever um and then last year we asked everybody we actually let them pick it and everybody okay. wanted to go to the new great wolf lodge up uh up in uh, maryland and uh we just told them you could bring your whole family because it was going to be a lot less expensive so just bring everybody you want you know so um cool. so that was a lot of fun um but we do we do quarterly rally speeches um last summer was pretty cool because uh my my uh, one of my managers and my father-in-law we took all of the production guys up to the poconos and we rented this great big house and we took all of the production guys fishing um and then a couple weeks later uh my daughter who was actually helping we moved her out of appointment center and marketing and stuff like that i asked her if she wanted to sell because we started a second company and she was like, yeah, I'll, you know, it sounds fun. I, you know, if I get to go out of the office, it'll be fun. I'll, you know, I'll be happy to sell dad. And um, she did great. She actually finished number eight on the nation for the franchise. Whoa. Um, so that, oh that was pretty good. But uh, Grace and I, and then we asked Gary if he wanted to do it too. He said, yeah. Um, us three, we took all of our sales folks uh, on a big golf trip. So that was pretty cool. So, so there's a lot of different stuff that we do. I mean, you know, we're very lucky in our office. Uh, we have a great big commercial kitchen in there and I love to cook. So, you know, like on a Friday, if I'm having a bad day, I'm like, I just go to the store and I buy a mess of amount of food and, and I just get to cook all morning and make myself happy. And, you know, the employees <laughs> love that, you know, um, there's times when, and it, and it's normally it's for the office, but what we'll do is we have a whole bunch of to go stuff. 
so we'll make food for the uh for the uh the crews and all that stuff and then we'll nice. hand deliver it out to crews because they're the ones that kind of you know they don't get to participate in a lot of stuff uh because we're on job sites all the time you know um mm -hmm. but i i believe you know that there's a thing in us that is we believe we do it for people um because G and I'm not going to go into the whole religious thing, but I mean Jesus white washed his disciples' feet, right? Um, because even he said, you know, I'm not as important as you guys or whatever, right? So I think that that when you make your employees and the folks who actually because here's the thing, when we first started, I generated my own income. And I right. could always justify that, hey, listen, my income is this, and I'm out there making sure that at least I'm producing that. Well, once you start scaling your business well you don't produce anything anymore like you can't you know the only thing you can everybody else is making your income for you and you know we we understand that and we need to serve them and you know make them understand how much we truly care because mm. i believe people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care mm. yeah no it's cool you guys have a really good culture like it actually sounds fun it's like it doesn't even sound like a job or a company you know it sounds like a, a place to hang out and obviously to make a difference in the people that you guys serve um that's awesome what is i gotta know this corny question but what is the food that you like cooking most uh well right now at my house i have a, um, a great big outside pizza oven so like cool. we're making like pizzas in like 90 seconds because like it's wood fired so you just get this fire going to a thousand degrees and you're throwing pizzas in there and 90 seconds later these pizzas are coming out of the oven so <laughs> that's a lot of fun that is awesome okay and the team what is what is the stuff maybe they have a favorite that you cook i mean yeah pizza might be one of them now so it's mexican pork chops so we'll take like pork chops and you you brown it and then you put it in with like a whole bunch of salsa and enchilada sauce and and hot sauce and um jalapenos and stuff like that and then you just simply braise it down. So when you take it out of the, uh, well, when you take everything out and you lay it in the big chafing pans, it's the pork just falls apart. And mm. it's super like red saucy and and all that. And then we'll do like a Mexican street corn off the cob in a big old, you know, pan. So I think whenever whenever I say, hey, what do you guys want? That's normally the one thing that they ask for. So that's awesome. Okay, here's a fun little question. So some people say you hire slow and you fire fast right there's also the other version of that do you have an alignment because i want to kind of dig into how you guys find people how you keep people do you have um a side of that coin that you prefer i um i have i i hate hiring um okay. i really <laughs> prefer not to be the one who has to do it um because i always like to see the good in everybody but right. um you know the we have we have a couple of philosophies in our office you know that if you won't spend a lifetime with someone don't spend a minute um so mm. it, it may take you a long time to have made the mistake but it shouldn't take you that long time to rectify the mistake um i i'm okay with firing somebody um however it should never be a surprise to them you know okay. that if we hire somebody and we made the wrong mistake well it's that's okay but you know, we have to at least give them the chance to try to improve and be better. Um, and look, sometimes you just hire shitheads, you know, right. and unfortunately it's, you know, some of the things that we do just isn't for everybody. Um, but, you know, once you realize it's a mistake, like I said, it's, you don't have to spend a lifetime. I refuse to spend a lifetime with somebody that, that I know stinks. And, you know, if, if, if you won't spend a lifetime, don't spend a minute, just move through your mistake, understand it, learn from it and then try not to make it again but but hiring is different now you know i um i i'm older and um i grew up where you know if i wasn't getting yelled at on a job site then i must not have been doing anything wrong you know well that's it's a different it's a different day now right and i think that <laughs> that if you, if you can't adapt to people um then um then how really good of a leader are you you know it's I, I, I'm learning um, to, to figure out that, that people want something different nowadays. It's not necessarily about the money. People truly want to make a purpose. And I actually believe that. Um, you know, like I said, back in the day, it was like, well, you know, you were told just to get a job, do this, do this, do that. And that's 
what we did. Um, but you know, nowadays it's if there has to be a purpose in someone's work. And I've watched people take less. My friends have taken less because they feel like they're making a difference in, in mm. the companies that they work for. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, but you could do, you know, you could go do this and you'll make this much more. And they're like, I just, I don't care. You know, it just right. it makes me happy. And it was like, you know, my, my generation, my dad's generation, like nobody gave a crap about that. It was like, you had to take care of your family and you just, you did the best you could. And, you know, you moved forward. And if you were unhappy, you, I don't know, you drank yourself, you know, when you got home or something, you know, it's, <laughs> but it's just, it's different now. And I think a lot of folks, they, they, they don't understand that they have to change like before you know you would make people sit through seven interviews and you grilled them and you made them do all these things well you know i believe now that um especially the you know it's it's just the tables have kind of turned a little bit and i have to almost court them instead of them courting me you know so i have to show them how good of a company we are right okay yeah make them feel welcome right well, and then, you know, they think like, I have to, like, when you, when you're, when you're interviewing somebody, it's like, well, Hey, what, what are you looking for? What's your perfect ideal job? And then it's, it, if they're like, well, you know, I want some place that's fun and I want to be able to do this and I want to grow and I want to be able to, to make more money and I want to advance. Well, if you have positions that are open that, that don't offer that, you got to be honest with those folks and right. say, look, this is actually what the job looks like. Is that something you're even willing to do? And you know, it's it's just it's it's like I said, I grew up in the nineties. You know, it's 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 just different. And if you can't adapt, you'll die, I promise. Hmm. Yeah, fair. Okay. So where do you guys find good people? Is it uh certain certain websites like Indeed? Is it Facebook? Is it, you know, uh, referrals word of mouth? I'm sure it's a big part. Yeah, you know, a lot of it is our employees bring people in, you know? Right. Um and and that i think is our biggest test that you know like a lot of my sales team came from one guy and they brought somebody in, and they brought somebody and they brought somebody and then they brought somebody in and you know if you're willing to bring your best friend in then you must trust the people that you work for because you're not going to screw your best friend over right mm. um you know indeed's cool um we've hired some people from indeed you know but i don't do normal indeed i mean we will we'll we'll put out an ad and we'll see who comes in um, but you know, I actually do the resume search most of the time because then I can at least kind of look and see what the, what the qualities are those people have. Um, you know, I, I also believe in, um, like guerrilla marketing, um, for employees. So, you know, it's, there, there's a book out there, the guy, I think it's, um, I think it's love works by Joe Man Manley, Manley, whatever it is. Um, and he was, I think it was either him or, Dar or Dar Darren Hardy on the entrepreneur role, I think it was Darren Hardy actually. So he went, um, he was in charge of this magazine or whatever, and he went to go interview like some head guy at Marriott. So the night before he stayed at a Marriott, uh, the same one that he was gonna interview this guy at. And he asked the guy, he was like, you know, I checked in yesterday and everybody was so nice. He was like, how do you train these people to be so nice? And the guy just looked at him. He's like, "That's you know, that's dumb." He was like, "We just found really nice people and then trained them how to do the job." So you right. know, we like I I I make our peers do the last interviews, um, whether it's the the crew that they're going on or the sales team or the the leadership team or whatever it is we do. Because if they won't fit inside that group, then even if they're the right person um, to be able to do that physical job, that's not the right person for our culture. Right. Um, so, you know, you have to really, I, you know, it says it, says it takes a, a village to raise a child, but I think it takes a village to hire a new employee. So you got to mm. make it, you got to make it an everybody event because the, you'll, cool. the other, the, the team members that are with you right now, you get a lot more buy-in because most of the time when you work at a company, you just get shoved with whoever the boss hires. And, and all of a sudden you're like, God, I hate this guy. Why'd they hire that jerk? You know? uh, well, now it's like, if, if you're calling them a jerk, then it's like, well, you hired the jerk. I didn't. Mm, so, interesting. Interesting. Okay. That's cool. I like that. That's really cool. Um, okay. Well, um, I know we're, we're getting closer on time here. Want to be respectful. Um, let's go into sales, marketing. Okay. We'll call it, you guys call it designers, I believe. Yes. Is that, Okay, cool. So first off, 
that's an awesome way to do it. I always thought the distinction of a name is really important mm -hmm. and people kind of embody it. You know, with sales, there's so many, unfortunately, bad connotations with it. And sometimes people, they put themselves in that, especially if there's a certain culture that propels it or there's incentives that propel it. So mm -hmm. could you tell me the idea, um, first off, with how you guys came up with designers and second off, how it sounds like they have a different touch. They're not just trying to get another dollar. They're really trying to serve right. people while, of course, still bringing in revenue. Right. Yeah. So, you know, our our folks that come out and take care of our homeowners, um, I call them designers because sell pe salespeople just sell. So they, they have to go out there and really design a system that's going to work for whatever that problem is. Um, you know, it's, it's like we don't call it a call center. We call it an appointment center because we're not making phone calls. We're making appointments, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want your salespeople out there, out there truly designing correct solutions, then they're just not salespeople, right? Right. Uh, and, you know, where there's, you know, you know, the whole ladder of rapport, you know, as a salesperson, you start out as a, a janky ass sales guy, and then you got to start to go up this ladder of rapport, and then you become like a trusted friend and advisor, an engineer and all these wonderful things. But it's, it's, it's very true, because, you know, they have to be all of those things. And the biggest thing is, is, you know, they're, they should be learning how to design more than they should be learning how to sell, because anybody can sell, but if it's not the correct thing they're selling, then you're running peers you know, you're putting like 40 peers on a chimney that ain't going to work, right? Or you're, you know, you're, you're doing one peer on a chimney and that isn't going to work either, you know? So we we emphasize that they have to learn how things work. So we're taking them to construction sites and we're like, you know, like in my development, they're doing all these crazy stair step voters and houses that are sitting on the hill. And I'm sitting here watching. I'm like, yeah, they're going to break soon. Um, you know, we've had to fix so many cracks in my development. It's crazy. Um, because we're just, your neighbors just, must love you guys. There he is you know, again. <laughs> I, it's it's my truck is kind of a billboard for our our our, <laughs> our office, I guess. So, um, but yeah. So you know, as far as our, our designers go, I I don't I want obviously I want them selling. You know, their their function is to get something sold. But if they sell it wrong, then you know that's where you know like like you said that one company that you worked with they said well if you screw up you're paying for it well we do that too by the way if if someone if someone does something that they know is wrong i'm gonna back charge them you know right, because right, with great right. risk and great reward right um it doesn't happen much in our company but you know if if you go out there and you are supposed to have a b c and d done and you purposely miss c like if you try to cut square footage and right. we've had we've had salespeople that came in our company or designers, and it was like you know thirteen hundred square feet, and they said it was a thousand. Well, our foremans are remeasuring as soon as they get there anyway, um, mm. and the, our foremans are bonus off of a complete project based on that square footage. And if they have to install more material, or it's going to obviously take them a lot longer, then you know that's not fair because our foremans would then lose money. I lose money. The only person that technically didn't was the sales guy. So, you know, the sales guys have to realize that, you know, we give them a margin of error, you know, like right. if there's, if it's this far off, but if it's that far off, well, that's, that's blatant, right? And mm -hmm. then you're going to get back charged because I think that you have to inspect what you, ex or, yeah, you have to inspect, you have to inspect what you expect. Sorry. Mm. Uh, and as long as, you know, and here's the thing, if a foreman says, hey, this square footage is off, I don't send out the designer. I we make the the foreman get the square footage, but I send a manager or myself out to double check the measurements, and then we're like, okay. guys, what happened? And right, let's figure this out. Yeah, sometimes it's on it, and you can actually see it where they transpose some numbers or something like that. And it's like, all right, look, you know, I could be dyslexic more than anybody, but we had <laughs> in our second company, we had one of our um, we called gurus in our second company, but. And that's because it's a franchise and that's why they make them call them. I think they try to do too many cute things in life. But, um, you know, we uh, we had one lady who literally was cutting square footage to try to get a sale. Um, oh, we, we let okay. her go. We found it was like six jobs in a row. And I was like, look, I'm sorry. This one time every two months is fine. But six times in a row, this is, this is a habit. We need to part ways. Six times in a row, you got to go. Right. Exactly. That's crazy. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, the short sightedness. And I mean, that goes from the ownership down. There's a lot of 
companies out there, unfortunately, their leadership is not like you guys. Like clearly just the things you're saying very much separate you. Your background, I've, I've had uh, lots of interesting conversations with people where they're like in the truck, they're on the site, which I'm cool with, but there's also a cigarette in their mouth. <laughs> and they're yelling at someone while we're on the podcast yeah, on the side. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, interesting. It's all good. I'm not going to judge, but like, you know, you're, you're constantly ranking yourself up, which then ranks up the people on your team and vice versa. Well, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta understand nobody's going to be better than you in your company. You mm. know, if you have a manager that's better than you, it, it's just never going to happen because they're eventually just going to fly down because you have to set the pace. You have to set the example. And listen, I've, you know, I've done a lot of stupid things in my life, you know, and over the years, hopefully I've gotten better and maybe one day I'll go to heaven. I don't know if I'll ever get there. Or not. Uh, but, you know, if, if, if uh, like foreman, we, we talk to our, our foreman constantly about this. It's like, you know, guys, you're the people underneath you aren't going to work any harder than you. If you're taking an hour lunch, they're taking an hour lunch. You know, mm. if you're on your cell phone all day long, they're on their cell phone all day long. Um, I went out to a job site the other day and one of our new guys, uh, it's actually one of our uh, our designers' kids uh, works for us, and I got to the job site because I had to deliver a couple um, things of uh, the little inspection ports. And uh, he was uh, getting some stuff out of the truck, and we were walking in together. And he was like, "And he was like, he hadn't worked with this particular foreman before." And he was like, "Man, that dude is fast." And I was like, "Yeah, who's he fast? He's been with us for like a hundred years." And uh, <laughs> He was like, no, he was like, he was like, they just don't stop moving. And I was like, well, yeah, but you got to think. I said, you can make $40,000 a year or $100,000 a year. Because I have a foreman that'll make $40,000 a year doing the exact same thing as the guy making $100,000 a year. Wow. And it's like, it's, it's like, I hate hourly wages because that's all you get as an hourly wage employee. I would rather give them an hourly wage and say, hey, here's all these ways you can make extra money. And right. if you want to make $100,000 now, that's based on your actions and your effort. So, you know, it's, it's, I, I hate just paying people an hourly wage and that's it. Like if your company's not um, incentive based, mm -hmm. then, you know, then you're never going to scale uh, because everybody's going to put in the same amount of effort. And it's like, why would this foreman work harder than this foreman if this foreman isn't putting any effort in and this guy's working his butt off, he's going to say, well, we're making the same amount of money. I'm just going to, I'm going to sit back and I'm going to relax a little bit too. So, mm -hmm. but if you can make an extra 50 or 60 grand a year, all of a sudden you're getting two and three jobs done that week. Like, like we have to be monitor our backlog very carefully because some of our foremans, they know they can make extra money. They will work super hard. And it's like, Whoa, guys, I need to slow down. <laughs> like I got to <laughs> like if sales, if our sales department has like half of a bad month, then I have to match that back a little bit. Um, but then mm. it's when when the sale picks right back up, then it's like, all right, guys, go make as much money as you want. Right, right. Yeah, everyone, run. Right. Okay, got it. Um, last last few questions. Marketing, how do you scale? How do you grow? What works best? Is it billboards, TV, radio, internet, a hybrid of everything? So we, we learned a long time ago that you have to have, um, you try to get as many leads as you can at your allowable cost, okay? So I... And maybe I shouldn't say it on this thing or not, but like I hate Angie's <laughs> list and all those things because they're really oh, that's fine. Leads. <laughs> that's I think totally they're fine. the worst leads God ever made. They're very, very cheap, right. but they never convert very well. So, so you yeah. have to understand, you know, your conversions in your company. So, you know, like I have, I have two companies, and um, Dry Zone, we're converting in our appointment center. We're converting like I think it was ninety eight percent of um, leads to ramp. Uh, wow. wow. Our, our second company, um, it's a it's a national appointment center, and we're converting like seventy percent, and 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 that part stinks a little bit, right? Um, mostly because we're not the ones doing it, in my opinion. Um, but you know, you have to when when you're looking at marketing, I I refuse to spend stupid money, and one thing that I've always felt that I was good, I've never said I was the smartest guy in the room. As a matter of fact, if I am the smartest guy in the room, we're all screwed. I truly really believe <laughs> oh. that you hire really smart people and you let really smart people do great things. Mm. Um, but one thing I know, one thing I am good at is asking good questions. So I know where I have to beat all of my competitors at, right? So 
if it's here, then I've got to figure out better ways to do that. Like, I believe that your message has to be extremely clear. I hate, um, like, billboards. You're going down the road and you see a billboard and you're going 55 miles an hour. And what's the phone number on it? Yeah, right. 855, uh, I don't remember, right? Um, same thing, really, with TV. Like, I was talking with um, um, one of our local uh, TV folks. And everybody's putting QR codes like right there on the uh, on the uh, commercial, and I'm like, you know, I was it was funny. I was watching YouTube, and I don't I don't hate TV, but I like watching YouTube. And I was gonna try to hurry up and grab my phone to take a picture of the competitor that was on there. I couldn't get out my phone fast enough, hit the uh, <laughs> button to even take a picture of it. And right, I'm like, how the hell <laughs> would that QR code ever mean anything then? And all it did was take a lot of real estate right here on the. Uh, on the commercial. So most people, I think they try to muddle their stuff, go down the road and look at some of the uh, stuff on, on business trucks. You know, first of all, if it's, if you just have it in the window, like your only lettering is in the windows or it's a magnet on the side, then you're a truck in a truck and you don't trust yourself enough to letter your own truck. Because once you letter it, you're not going to get the same resale value out of it. Right. Um, yeah. That's a commitment. So if, if you see, you know, trucks going down the road, um, just look at their overall message. Do you even understand it, you know? So we we think of very simplistic things, you know, we're a crawl space and a basement waterproofer, foundation repair company, we lift and level concrete. Um, that's tough to kind of get it all on one thing. Um, but when you look at our logos and stuff like that, it, it's very big, it's very clean, it's very bright, like a lot of billboards, I hate them because, um, especially the elect electronic ones, I just want it all to be completely white and then have everything in black lettering. Well, they won't let us do it, so I flip it. It's all black with white lettering. Um, oh, I guess it messes up the pixels on it or it'll burn out the tubes or something. But, really? I've never heard that. That's fascinating. Yeah, there's there's like they give you like these these chart of colors that you can use. So I'm just like, all right, all black, put the letters in white. Um, hmm. and it's literally like one of our billboards just says smelly crawl face, drivezone.com. Mm. you'll see that as you're going past it and you might remember drivezone.com, you know? Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, anything, you know, so that's billboards covered. Anything newspaper, TV, radio, internet? Uh, do you have a, a favorite maybe by chance? I don't. I'll be honest. Like, we don't do a whole lot of of advertising. First of all, I think that you're, you can get better results from homeowners that you've already done than anything. So mm. like my, my allowable cost per lead is still a hundred dollars and it's been that way for 20 years. And we still will do, you know, 2000 homes a year. Wow. And I'm only paying a hundred dollars per lead. Well, wow. I think it's about 120 right now, but. That's so amazing. You, but you've got to work with your advertisers. You know, you got to sit down with them. You got to, I don't want to say beat them up, but you have to, they have to show you why it's going to work because otherwise they're going to talk about reach and frequency and all this BS and, 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 Frankly, that's what it is. It's a bunch of BS. Um, you know, <laughs> right. but you have to ask your homeowners. You got to get out there and do the work. You got to talk to your homeowners. Hey, where do you watch? What do you listen to? You know, what are you paying attention to? How did you hear about this, this, and this? And you know, I'll sit there, and uh, if we go to a restaurant, I'll start asking people next to us. You know, just where do you pay attention to? What do you look at? You know, I'll strike up a uh, a conversation with anybody just to find out what somebody's looking at and what they're paying attention to. And that's you can find out really what everybody's at. Because all of a sudden, you're going to start seeing a bunch of common themes that the channel you thought that everyone was watching, they only watched it for seven things, and then they're watching something else all day long. You mm. know? And it's so funny, too, because I I love, like, the Dana Whites and these big business people. Yeah. He said the funniest thing about, I believe it was, like, Jake Paul, if you're familiar, the YouTuber. He oh, said yeah. something where he goes, listen, that guy's an influencer kids follow him and i was like yeah a lot of kids follow him you're right a lot of people in general but his whole thing was like he can't sell pay-per-views we can he has kids following him or young people primarily they right. don't have money just like you know in your world like oh uh, you could get 10 million followers on your instagram and it's like yeah but are those your target client do they own homes right. like do they have money to do the jobs like uh, it's Joke. So we actually, it's funny because we actually have somebody in our office that literally makes TikToks. And I still cool. cannot believe that I pay someone to make TikToks. <laughs> um, cool. 
and we do that not really necessarily for the TikTok thing because we had like one uh, TikTok video, million like a million views or whatever it is you do on TikTok or whatever. Um, Wild. But they also make other videos for us, you know, for Facebook and and all that other stuff, and they'll do internal things and all that stuff. But but you're right. It's like I turn around one day and it was like there was nobody my age I know that is buying mm -hmm. a damn thing off of TikTok. Um, right. But but I'll tell you what though. So um, we were talking earlier. I, you know, I live in a country club, and um, we'll sit down at our. It's it's an it's it's a semi private country club. So like they're still public and the clubhouse has a restaurant in it, and that's definitely open to the public. And I'll strike up conversations with all kinds of people. And I've found out that more people my age are actually looking at that than I thought too. So, um, <laughs> and I was talking, my dad's 81 years old and he gets on TikTok, and I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was like, we were are you serious? And he's like, yeah, he's like, you know, it's, he's like, you can get lost in there. And I'm like, yeah, well, no kidding. But, um, it's just because you, think it's true doesn't mean it necessarily is sometimes right so you, you it's it's a never ending thing of what's going on what's happening what's going on what's happening you know because what i i still i cannot believe that people sit around all damn day and watch you um um tiktok i mean Jeez. and then sometimes but i'll sit there at night sometimes with my wife and my daughter and they're share they'll share a tiktok with me and because we're like the same you know like those houses where I'm on the phone, she's on the phone, she's on the phone. And it's like there's stuff on, on the TV and then we're sharing stupid cat videos with everybody. Right. But, uh, and three hours later, you're like, oh man, I gotta go to bed, you know? Mm, yeah, that's the evening. Like I work really hard during the day, do my gym stuff, go play some pickleball, that kind of stuff. And then I do partake in this. Um, right. That's that's actually too where my whole business came from. Is like, hey, this is the current and the future. Like you're a YouTube guy, I'm a YouTube guy. I literally don't have normal TV. I have a few little streaming apps, but I'm definitely a YouTube premium subscriber. I right. could not do it with the free thing with all the junk ads that I yeah, get. I, kind see, of that's the hard part. I do. I like my daughter. She pays for the um, thing of Spotify, but I I still listen to the commercials on Spotify. Really? I, you know, I mean, normally I'm listening to Spotify when I'm playing golf, and it sits on my golf cart or whatever, and you know, I don't give a shit up there because i ain't paying ten dollars a month for that but even like the other <laughs> night heather, heather and i we uh were sitting down and i put on youtube and i was like i didn't feel like watching like something educational whatever and brewster million the old um richard Pryor movie was on there and i didn't know that youtube even did movies so i was like oh brewster million well it was like every five minutes there was a damn commercial on That's this crazy. thing i was like oh yeah i might have to go buy this thing how much is it and then i was like do i really want to spend was it like 25 bucks a month or whatever on that and then mm. I was like, I don't know, man. I was like, I might get into that. Because um, I was like, I, I haven't seen that movie in 100 years, you know. I was all into it in that commercial. <laughs> you get all into it? Commercial. So, you know. Yeah, it's not it fun. I watched uh, Coneheads, if you remember that. Oh, yeah. Dan Aphra, that yeah. was really, really fun. And he's, like, into Aliens, too. So I guess that kind of – he um, you ever seen the vodka, the Crystal Skull? It's oh, yeah. here. Uh -huh. That – I, I don't know if he owns it 100%. He's at least a partner, if not the full owner of that Dan company. Edwards? Yes, that's what okay. I've been told. I heard it on okay. a podcast. I, I think I did a little bit of research probably two or three years ago. I looked into it. But this guy loves aliens so much so that he, he's been in Coneheads. He has this company or is very involved in it. Huh. Um, well, cool. I, again, want to be respectful of time. So any any last little tidbits, um, and then you and I will stay on the line. We'll sign off. We'll obviously shout out your company. But any little tidbits, and then please let everyone know how to find you guys online, how to give you guys a call. Sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the easiest way is dryzone.com. Um, so, you know, we have a great website. Um, why do I feel like Donald Trump when I did that? But um, so we have a great <laughs> website. We really do. Um, a lot huge. of information and a lot of that good stuff. You can um, contact us on there. I can give you the local number, but it's, once again, nobody remembers it, but it's 302-684-5034. So, and that's, that's, that's awesome. how you get a hold of us. Awesome. And all we're right. on Instagram and Facebook and all that crap, so. Even TikTok. <laughs> even, <laughs> even TikTok, yes, we are. In case your dad wants to watch. Exactly. Your dad or anyone else's dad who's listening. Um, okay, last question. Uh, the little tidbits. If you have rapid fire two or three things you wish you knew about the business that you now know when you started, you know, what are those two or three things that are kind of rapid fire 
could really compel the audience perhaps that's listening and then we'll sign off um so yeah so don't hire shitheads and don't be afraid to spend good money on good people because mm -hmm. when you try to go cheap with someone you're gonna find cheap people so like mm -hmm. i have no problem with paying people what they're worth fair you'll scale your business faster doing that than anything else okay fair enough any last little tidbit or that's good to go um you know wear knee pads you know. <laughs> there we go hello all right <laughs> say no more that's the perfect sign off um, okay, so Bill, you and I are going to hang out on the line uh, before the next podcast, three more minutes from now. We're going to hang out. Um, otherwise, guys, thank you so much for listening. Bill, thank you so much for coming on. That was a powerful podcast. That was, was a lot fun. of fun. Um, all right, guys. Well, we will catch you on the next episode. I'll see you guys. Thanks for joining us today for another revealing episode of Foundation Repair Success Secrets. Don't forget to subscribe so you can keep discovering the tools, tactics, and techniques to ensure your online presence is as solid as the foundations you repair. Keep digging deep, and we'll see you in the next episode.